All right, welcome back. So cardiac anatomy and physiology. And the second part's gonna be very important. A lot of us get a lot of cardiac anatomy in paramedic courses and in our bio courses, but we don't get a lot of physiology. We're gonna focus heavily on the physiology after learning the anatomy in this bit. All right, so what is the human heart? It's the size of your fist and it's a muscle. Those are the, the two basic concepts of it. Uh, it sits just to the left of center in the chest in an area called the mediastinum and it's canted a little bit, turned and angled. It has a couple of layers. So the first layer, the innermost layer, is the endocardium. And if you've done any dissection labs, you've noticed how you can feel on the inside of the atria and the ventricles. It's very smooth. It's a very low friction surface for fluid to pump through and not be very turbulent. The endocardium, in addition to being the, the inside layer, okay, it's bathed in blood and it doesn't really require a lot of perfusion for that reason. So there's not a lot of your uh, cardiac vessels and things that are going to run to there with the specific focus on perfusing that, that inner most layer. Now the next layer out, going from inside to out, is the myocardium. Now the myocardium is the muscle, myo meaning muscle, right? Um, it is able to conduct electrical impulses. It is the possessor of the automaticity we've been learning about. It is the reason the heart can contract and thus it is what makes the heart an actual muscle. All right. The next layer out is the pericardium. So this is the sac. When we hear about pericarditis and things like that, this is the sac that surrounds the heart. It's got around 50 mLs of fluid in it, depending on what text you read or what patient you're looking at. It's a clear fluid, a clear to yellowish fluid, and it allows the heart to move inside the sac without friction. All right, so the heart can expand and contract, it can move in and around, and it's got a lubricant. You can think of it like motor oil. Um, there are four chambers in this muscular organ. Those four chambers are, of course, the left atrium and right atrium, um, the left ventricle and right ventricle, respectively. The blood flow order is left atrium, or excuse me, right atrium to right ventricle, and then left atrium to left ventricle. And of course, there's some interconnected stuff in there. We're gonna talk about some pipes that connect everything to everything else. Um, the atria are the superior chambers, they're on top, and their job is to promote filling of the ventricles. So while fluid does kind of run at a constant pace because there's pressure, and does put some filling into the ventricles, the atria give it what's usually called a kick and provide a larger expansion to the ventricles, which enables it to have a greater force of contraction. This is commonly called the atrial kick. And just as a quick side note, your AFib patients often don't have it because their atria don't function correctly, all right? So the ventricles are the larger portion. They are the more muscular sections um, you can think of them as the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The right ventricle serves the sole purpose of moving fluid into the lungs and back out for oxygenation. Thusly, it doesn't need much muscle, so it doesn't have as much muscle. And I'll assume this is all under normal conditions. The left ventricle, however, is responsible for sending blood to the rest of the body. So it is going to be much more muscular. The myocardium is thicker. It will have a greater amount of nerve conduction cells and pathways uh, as a way to trigger more of that muscle in order to allow that muscle to really kick out and send that blood all over the body because it's gotta get you know from the top of your brain to the tips of your toes. And we depend completely upon the left ventricle for that under normal circumstances. So anytime you have a pump, you have a valve. If you're going to squeeze something in a certain direction, you have to have something blocking it off in the other direction, right? So for that reason, we have four valves in the heart. We have the tricuspid, we have the pulmonary, we have the mitral, and we have the aortic. And in that order, right? So in the order of blood flow, we have that. A quick and easy way to remember that is toilet paper my ass. Now I know that is not the most PC way to put that out there, but it sticks. It People remember that. Toilet paper my ass, tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, aortic. Those are the four valves of the heart. 
Now, two of those valves are called the semilunar valves, and they're the valves that separate the actual chamber from the artery into which it empties. So you're going to have one of those between the left ventricle and the aorta, and then one between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. They're called semilunar because of their shape. Their whole concept is to not allow blood to back out of that artery back into the ventricle. The other two valves of the heart are between the atria and the ventricles, and you are going to have the tricuspid valve, so named because it has three leaflets. That's going to be in between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and its whole job is not to allow blood to go from the right ventricle back up into the atria because then you would lose pressure. And of course, the mitral valve, which is a bicuspid valve, it's also called bicuspid, uh, it has two leaflets. Its entire job is not to allow blood to go from the left ventricle back up into the left atrium, right? So that's the entire concept here. So blood gets introduced into the heart from the vena cava into the right atrium. It flows through the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is closed. Then the right ventricle contracts, pushing the blood through one of the semilunar valves into the pulmonary artery. It pushes this blood through, the valve closes, the blood goes into the lungs, it circulates through the lungs, it comes back into the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, then through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, the, left, the, the mitral valve will close, the left ventricle will then contract, pushing the blood through the other semilunar valve, the aortic valve, into the aorta, and then the aortic valve will close, not allowing blood to go back into the left ventricle. So that's your series of valves and what they do. Another important point of this is what you hear when you listen to the heart, the lub dub, right? Da -dum, da -dum. You are hearing those valves slam shut with pressure behind them. The pressure causes them to slam shut. This is why when someone has low blood pressure, you don't hear their heartbeat as loud, right? Muffled heart tones and things and things like tamponade and stuff like that. And of course, there's other mechanisms at play. We're just gonna be generalized here. Um, you go forward from this into, of course, the central circulation where the body circulates and it all comes back around and this process renews itself. And that kind of wraps up that section about the valves. So let's talk about the type of blood and where it goes. Um, so the right atrium, <clears throat> excuse me, receives deoxygenated blood from the venous circuit by way of the superior and inferior vena cava. So they meet right before the heart. They turn into one big pipe with a very low amount of pressure. It goes into the right atrium. The right atrium pushes that blood into the actual right ventricle. Valve closes, right ventricle pushes it out to the lungs. The lungs then do their thing. They oxygenate and we can cover more of that if I can do some lectures on pulmonology and get away with it. They oxygenate everything. They bring it all back into the left atrium. The left atrium pushes it down into the left ventricle. This blood is newly oxygenated. And then it moves forward from there out of the left ventricle through the aorta into the central circulation to the rest of the body. And this is the reason that we say the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood. Because veins and arteries are labeled that way, not based on what they carry, which is a common misconception, but based on whether they are going to or going away from the heart. So the pulmonary artery is going away from the heart. So it's called an artery. The fact that it's carrying deoxygenated blood is irrelevant. The pulmonary vein is bringing oxygenated blood back from the lungs into the heart. And because it's coming to the heart, it's a vein. So the fact that it carries oxygenated blood is irrelevant to the fact that it's a vein. They're named for a different reason. So while that sounds like a fun trivia fact, right? The pulmonary artery is the only one that carries deoxygenated blood. In truth, it's just sort of a different way of looking at it. It's just a byproduct of how we name things and how we, we call them. And of course, the internal structure of those vessels. Remember the arteries have thicker tunica intimas and, or tunica medias and things like that. So it is an artery in all forms, It, the pulmonary artery. It acts like an artery, it works like an artery, it just happens to carry deoxygenated blood, okay?